My name is Matt Marino. I'm a professor and research scientist at the University of Central Florida. I'm on sabbatical this year, which is absolutely fantastic. So I've had the year to think about the most nerdy slide presentation I could put together. And that's what I'm going to put up for you today. This is seriously going to be like research dense, but I'm going to tell you the backstory of why the research happened, because it has a lot to do with UDL and building relationships, which Joni was just talking about. So students with disabilities and other executive function deficits are struggling to maintain in STEM majors, right? They're struggling to persist, and they're struggling to perform. Now, this is my line of research, so I get really excited about it. And we have some amazing findings with this study that I will get to, but I am going to take the time give you the backstory. So here it is. It's January in 2014, and I'm sitting at a meeting with the advisory board from the Student Accessibility Services Office. So that's the office where kids who come to the university as undergraduates, thank you, they have disabilities, they come to that office and they get services that you would see in a K-12 network, right? So there's all the accessibility piece. And they're talking about how a majority of their students are struggling in certain introductory STEM classes. Well, they didn't say STEM classes, they said introductory courses. But after listening to the voices around the table, I said, those are all STEM classes. What the heck's happening there? Next day, 9 o'clock in the morning, I go to see Biology 1. Okay? Now, it's been a while since I've been in Biology 1. I've completely forgotten probably what they were teaching there. But I, I pop my head in, look around, and it looks like the students are paying attention and taking some notes. And there's a guy in the front of the room, and he's talking. Looks like something I would expect. Now, this is a big room, OK? I'm at UCF, 68,500 students. It's a big university. There's 200 people in this class, theater-style seating. So I decide I'm going to go in, and I sneak in this door at the top of the classroom, and I start walking along, and I'm like watching all the kids down here to see what they're doing. Some of them are doodling in their notebooks. They're not really taking notes. They're not paying any attention to this guy. Others are texting. A couple kids are sleeping. Okay, It's 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking, it's a Tuesday. It's not a Friday morning. What is going on in these classes? So then I sit down in the seat, and I start listening to the lecture. Now, this guy has such a thick accent that after two minutes, I realize I have to spend all of my cognitive energy focused on what he's saying just to make sense of what's coming out of his mouth. All right? So this is clearly a problem. I have a bachelor's degree in animal science. I was a pathobiologist and a secondary science teacher. And I'm taking all of my energy just to understand this guy. So I leave, and I go, and I meet with the science leads later on. These are the people who are in charge of these classes. And I said, look, if you've got a problem with executive function, you cannot possibly follow along with the classes that we're offering to these students. So executive function, just so we're all on the same page, Cognitive, behavioral, and emotional self-regulation to achieve a goal-oriented behavior, OK? It's more predictive than IQ of school success, and we're not teaching it in a lot of our classes. So I teach a secondary special education methods class. And I start thinking, OK, UDL, how can I get the students in that class most of whom are practicing um, elementary school teachers, right? To work with these college students and provide the executive function mentoring that they need. Sounds like a novel idea, right? So here are the elements that are included in executive function. I don't know if you can read this, but planning task initiation, organization, working memory. Um, all of these things are contributing to what's happening with the college students when they're trying to be successful in STEM. Now, here's where the relationship piece comes in. 
I get these students who are working on their master's degrees in my class. The first thing that I teach them is universal design for learning, okay? So they come in. Originally, when I went and met with the, the science leads, I said, UDL is really about accessibility. So all you have to do is predict what your students are going to bring to the classroom, anticipate that variability, and then you can serve them. I had one lady who was really excited about UDL when I told her about it and I showed her all these fancy slides about UDL. She's like, I'm going back to the faculty. We're going to get everything changed. A week later, she calls me. No one on the faculty wants to do it. It's too much work. What do you mean? Anticipate learner variability and plan around that? These are weed out classes. That's what they told me. So I decide in my infinite wisdom that I will write a proposal to the National Science Foundation and say we're going to use UDL and we're going to use these mentors from my secondary methods class and we're going to teach these students executive function skills in college. Now when I wrote it, I didn't think that anyone would fund it, but they actually gave us money to do the study, which makes me very excited, okay? So here's where the nerdy part comes in. I had to put in operational definitions. None of that really matters. Um, we measured performance of the college students using GPA. We, manage, or we um, assessed persistence by determining whether the student actually changed from a STEM to a non-STEM major, okay? Now, let me tell you about these college students, right? To get into UCF, you have to have the same standards as everybody who doesn't have any sort of executive function deficit to get in. So no one really wants to accommodate these students or do anything differently, but they have to be taught these basic skills. So we started by doing a study. Oh, and you can't see it, but I can see it on mine. So I have these little cues on my screen up here. I'm going to give you an executive function tip. I have a little blue star that comes up and says, spend a while talking about the slide. <laughs> and I try to teach that to my college students too, right? OK, so we started by going up to this college called Landmark College, which is in a rural town, Putney, Vermont. I don't know, has anyone ever heard of Landmark College? My aunt, Steve, the only two raising their hands. OK, it's a little school for students with disabilities, 450 kids. All right, that's not much compared to 68.5 at UCF. And they have this wraparound dynamic program that teaches executive function and does all this stuff. And we said in the proposal, we're going to study what they do with 450 students and then bring it over and use it with 68,500. That sounds totally unscalable now that I say it out loud. But when I was writing the proposal, it actually made sense. This was a pilot study, by the way. So we ended up with 120 students. Um, who participated in it over the course of three years. But when we got to Landmark, we studied what they were doing, and we realized that a big key was building relationships. And so that's what we took with us back. So building relationships, using technology, and then reinforcing grit, persistence, and perseverance in those students was the top factor for them staying in school and staying a STEM major. Doesn't that make sense? So now I had to figure out how do I take and teach that to my secondary or my graduate students who work with elementary school kids. So I said to them, here's your, here's your semester objective. You're going to do a case study of a college student with an executive function disorder, and you're going to work with them every week for the semester. And what you need to do is take the, um, the Barclay, which is this big test that we give to establish their executive function abilities, right? It's an 89-item test, takes about 90 minutes to complete. They have to sit down with these students, look at the results, and then come up with short and long-term goals for the semester, okay? 
This is the final model that we ended up coming up with. Now, when I started, I figured technology was the way to go. So we used this Adobe Connect platform. And what that does is it allows you to capture the video so that when the mentor is working with the mentee, it's recorded. And then I can transcribe it and do an analysis that way, right? It's also great for looking at the reliability of how they're implementing what you're asking them to implement because you can go back and review it and you can review it with them. Then Hurricane Matthew came, which is ironic because that's my first name. And when it came, Adobe didn't work at all. Like we couldn't get anyone to have the video connection, power was down, school was closed for three weeks. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're right in the middle of my first full implementation of this model and it's dying right in front of me. So what did we do? We improvised, that's what educators do. We said, you can do face-to-face, -face, you can do texting, you can do phone conversations, but you still need to be meeting with these students every week and holding them accountable and making sure that they're making continued progress. All right, I'm not gonna get into this whole treatment group. So by the way, these slides are all up online if you guys wanna download them. And my story's up there too that I'm telling now. And it's probably more accurate than the one I'm actually telling you because I'm kind of ad-libbing as I go. It's the first time I've given this talk, so. <laughs> anyway, if you want more information, you can go and look at that. This is really the key to the presentation, okay? When we went to the students afterwards, these are the STEM majors with executive function deficits, and said, what are the things that made the biggest difference to you this semester? The flexible, proactive approach was first. Next was that one-to-one -one connection with the mentor that they had. Also the use of non-directive questioning, which I had never even heard of until I went to Landmark College because that was not in my vernacular. So non-directive questioning, that means you're asking questions to get the student to elicit a response without forcing them into a a pigeonhole of an answer, right? Collaborative problem solving and then growth mindset. This came across all 120 students said the exact same thing. So I'm pretty confident in that finding. All right, I, w the graduate students had to do semi-structured interviews with their mentees. So they had to go in and gather a bunch of information, which was then built into a case study at the end. I tell you this because when you go online, you'll see what they had to do for the case study. You can download the file, and all of the criteria for the case study are in there. The most important piece was getting to know the student. So they couldn't make any of their plans until they had sat down over several weeks and gone through and found out everything about the student. What does the student do for hobbies? What do they do for fun? What do they do for music? Are they playing sports? All of these questions they have to answer. And then based on those responses, they came up with a plan to teach them the executive function skill where they had the largest deficit. All right, now I get to the fun part, which is the results, right? I'm gonna skip ahead. All right, this was the most exciting piece. The students do this, and they do it for three semesters, so we had 60 students in the control and 60 students in the treatment condition. Treatment's getting this mentoring, okay? The results were statistically significant positive, right? So if you're in the treatment condition, your performance as measured by your GPA is statistically significantly higher than those students who aren't getting the EF mentoring. We expected that, but we were really excited to see it actually statistically play out because you never know, it's sort of a gamble, right? And then when we looked at persistence, there was also a statistically significant difference, which really surprised me because we had a couple students who said, I don't think I'm gonna stick with this. I'm a physics major, I'm getting out of here. But they didn't. We didn't have anyone change majors from the treatment condition. That to me is super impressive. 
So then the next thing is to think about why, right? And I'm going to go to this slide to tell you about that. The one that surprised us the most was humor. All of the students in the treatment condition said humor was in their top three reasons that they were in an effective relationship with their mentor. Because their mentor was funny and real and made jokes with them and made fun of themselves and was going, I didn't even know you could do this, but here's this cool thing that I found about your campus. And so that was really impressive to us. So then you have to step back and say, is this generalizable to a larger cohort? So after we had these statistically significant results, we went back five years and looked at all the different programs that had been offered to the students, and we followed 78,719 students through their STEM courses to see if there was a difference in performance or persistence across gender, disability, or race. For gender and disability, there was absolutely no difference. That is super impressive. Five years, 78,000 students, and there's no difference. The reason why we believe is these programs that are right up here. So like Girls Excelling in Math and Science provides mentoring opportunities so that girls can work with industry professionals. That was an impressive piece. Um, so here's the bad thing. I can't track any of this data because the university doesn't collect it. So I can't measure whether their participation actually made a difference or not until we go back to do the next round. Our hypothesis is this is the reason. They have all these mentoring opportunities at UCF, and they're taking advantage of them. So in conclusion, I want to say that the UDL mentoring can make an enormous difference in students' lives from early age all the way through post-secondary school. And you need to look for resources in your environment to task. So I did it by grabbing my secondary methods students. But it can be anyone in your school district who's interested in picking up a mentor. Some of my mentors had multiple people they were working with if they had the bandwidth. If you have further questions on this, you can contact me via this email. Like I said, the PowerPoint the narrative and a word version of the talk are all up online. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit here and listen to me today.